All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the May meeting of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. I'm the president of the roundtable, Matt Borders, and I'm going to give a shout out as usual to our hosts, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Unfortunately, uh, some of their staff's feeling a little under the weather tonight, so we're going to be, I'll be doing all of the talking for them. But the museum is, of course, back open again. You definitely want to get down there if you can. It's some wonderful exhibits, and we greatly appreciate their hosting these events, particularly because tonight our speaker, a colleague of mine and a friend of the last several years, has joining us from Massachusetts. So she couldn't make it all the way down to Frederick, Maryland for the talk. So tonight we're going to have my colleague from the Springfield Armory up there in Massachusetts, Susan Ashman. And Susan's going to be talking to us about some of the research that she has done on some of the items at the Armory, Springfield Armory, a fascinating place. And Susan, I'll turn it over to you to kind of uh, tell us a little bit about the Armory and then dive into the presentation mm -hmm. this evening. Okay, do you want me to put my screen on now for you? Uh, actually, why don't we just chat a little bit about yourself and, and the Armory, and then we'll dive into the presentation. Yeah, so uh, as Matt said, I am uh, the lead park ranger at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site. We are an urban park in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. And I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for attending this evening's presentation. I know we're all busy, so I, I really appreciate your time on this. Um, I just want to give you a little background on the Springfield Armory about my site. So it was uh, the government, mainly the U.S. Army Ordnance, oversaw production of small arms for the United States military for 174 years from 1794 to 1968. And uh, the first firearm that was manufactured there was the 1794 Springfield Charleville, and the last was the M14. So for 174 years, um, again, they manufactured small arms for the U.S. military. So at the beginning of the Civil War, though, the government was forced to buy firearms from any available source, including European arsenals for surplus firearms. And so many, many of these uh, firearms arrived from Europe to the armory, and they were ordered to keep a sample of them at that time. And with these, plus battlefield pickups from different wars uh, during the Civil War as well, and a number of the 800,000 rifled muskets that were manufactured at the Springfield Armory for the Union Armory, the collection grew. And so there has been a museum um, at the Armory since 1871. And it started out as a reference collection for the engineers, and it grew from there. And now there are more than 10,000 weapons in our collection. And um, it's been a national park site since 1978. Uh, and we are open uh, Wednesday through Sunday from 9.30 to 4. So come out and see us. And you can't beat the price because we're free. <laughs> Fantastic. Got to love the free sites, especially yeah. <laughs> in this day and age. But I understand, Susan, you've done some pretty in-depth research on one of the arms there at the Armory, and that's going to be the focus of the talk tonight? Absolutely. So that, to me, is probably the most interesting thing I find is the Civil War firearms that we have there. And it's fascinating to me because the Civil War firearms have more artwork on the stock than any other firearms that we have in the collection, which I find so intriguing. And I always like, like you, Matt, the soldier stories, the stories behind those firearms, because usually they're anonymous. So without these names, which we'll see a couple of these firearms, you just don't know who had them. So I've been doing some research for years on this one, and I'm pretty excited to tell that story. Excellent. Well, let's uh, share the screen and dive in then. All right. Let's see. All right. 
So uh, here's my site, uh, Springfield Armory. Again, uh, that's a, a great shot we have there. And again, I hope uh, you all can uh, come down to the armory and say hello and visit our collection. So this is our storage facility. Unfortunately, only 14% of our collection is on the museum floor. So that's about 86% uh, behind the scenes. And, and sometimes I think, well, how many firearms do you need out? But a lot of uh, our visitors say, well, put out all of them, but that would be a lot. So whenever I go up into the collection area, I'm always surprised at how silent it is up there. It's, it's almost eerie in a way, the silence. And to me, it shouldn't be so quiet up there. And I think, what if these firearms could tell their story? And I doubt it would be in a conversational tone because what stories could they tell us not only about the soldiers, but about the battles that they were witness to? So to me, that conversation would be deafening once you're up there, the terror, the screaming, the crying, the pain, being homesick. And so I think all of these tell the story. And then nestled amongst all these firearms are these beautiful Civil War ones that we have there. And again, these carbons in the stock that they have, again, of artwork, names of battles, or the names of their sweethearts, or the name their name or the name of their regiment, which I always like because it makes it so much easier to, for me to research who had these firearms. And that to me is probably one of the most interesting parts of my job, finding that out. So one of those stood out to me, not really for the name on the stock. If you look closely, you can see on the stock, it says RH Weekly. But more so for me is the battle damage that's on this rifle. And we're going to see closer pictures of it um, later on in the presentation. So this is an 1853 British Enfield. And again, it says RH Weekly on the stock. And I just wanted to know if this firearm was so badly damaged, well, what happened to RH Weekly? You know, did he survive the Civil War? Did he not? I wanted to find out more. So that's kind of where the story begins on this one. So it turns out RH Weekly is Rufus Weekly, and he was born on January 5th, 1840, on a family farm to parents Jerusha. Uh, Jeff uh, Jerusa and Thomas Jefferson Weekly. And uh, on this farm here, you can kind of see the, the weekly plot there where it says Isaac Wheatley. That was Rufus Weekly's grandfather. Uh, the farm was hundreds of acres uh, where they grew tobacco, corn, wheat, oats, root vegetables in their garden. Uh, he was one of 11 kids and the, um, you can see on the top, this is an 1860 census. Uh, you have one of the brothers, Robert, Robert Lee Weekly was a mill hand. There was George Washington Weekly. Uh, he was a school teacher. And you have Thomas Weekly. He was a farm hand along with Rufus and his brother as well. So when the call to arms came to join the Confederate cause, uh, knocking on the weekly door in 1861, George, Robert, and Thomas all answered that call immediately. And all three listed, enlisted in the 42nd Regiment, uh, Tennessee Infantry Company G. And this was part of Corliss's brigade, Waltham's division under Stewart's Corps. And despite being 21, and of course old enough, Rufus did not enlist until October 24th, 1861 with the rank of private. And I think as well as like some of his descendants think that he didn't um, enlist right away with his brothers because he was listed on that census as a farmhand. And if all his brothers left, well, who's gonna help with the harvest that fall? So it's really interesting that he enlisted 
on October 24th, 1861. And then his brother basically waited another year, his youngest brother, and enlisted a year later, I'm sure for the same reason, because uh, that fall harvest. And like many people, many soldiers, families during the Civil War, they probably didn't think the war was going to last very long. So Rufus trained at Camp Cheatham in Cedar Hill, Tennessee. Uh, it was used for less than a year before it was abandoned. And soon after enlisting, again, he enlisted in October of 1861, the 42nd Tennessee Regiment, they uh, marched on to Fort Donaldson. And this was gonna be Private Weekly's, his first engagement, again, because he just enlisted four months earlier. And they mar marched directly off the boat to support the 30th Tennessee Infantry, which was being charged by federal troops. And I always like these maps that the Civil War Trust puts out. And um, below Floyd, where the little green circle is, that is where the 42nd uh, Tennessee Regiment was at that time. So the weather was pretty unseasonably warm. So they left their baggage, which included their blankets, of course, and coats at the wharf. And Thomas Turner of the 42nd Tennessee, and in the same company as Private Weekly said, soon night came on and with it cold rain, then sleet, then snow, and to make our distress complete, our men were nearly all without coats. We were ordered to leave our baggage at the wharf, which we did and never heard of it again. Hence, in this condition, the 42nd Regiment fought the battle at Fort Donaldson, and in this condition, they were surrendered on the morning of the 16th of February, 1862. So as we all know, the Battle of Fort Donaldson was a Union victory, and over 13,500 Confederates were captured, including Private Weekly. So it's interesting how the Union Army wasn't really sure what to do with all the Confederates captured, nor the War Department at that time. But soon they figured out they would send them to Camp Douglas, which is right outside of Chicago. So approximately 7,000 enlisted Confederates would be sent to Camp Douglas, and it's located on the south side of Chicago as prisoners of war. And by they, they went there by rail and steamboat and the first prisoners from Fort Donaldson arrived at Camp Douglas on February 20th, 1862. And the prisoners found to their surprise that really there was no, no prison there. Um, G.L. Wells of the 7th Texas Infantry actually was pleased with his accommodations after such a rough trip by steamer and train. You usually don't hear that with prisoners of war that when they get to say um, Elmira or Andersonville that they're like, wow, these are really nice accommodations here. But again, this was used as a training camp before by the Union Army. So you have these Confederates arriving after the, this horrible trip on the steamers. And this GL Well says, I will remember the disembarking at Chicago by daylight on the morning of February 20th. I recall how we stood shivering in the cold, crisp atmosphere, waiting for the command to take up the march to the quarters that had been prepared for us. Colonel Mulligan was in command of the camp. And with a foresight that does credit to his heart of him, who suggested it, the stoves and the barracks into which we were ushered had been heated red hot, and the barracks had been fitted with a new hay, a more comfortable place under the circumstances I never saw. So again, you don't really hear about a prison camp being so good. So this is what it looked like um, toward the end of the war in 1864 at that time. But those conditions are going to change really fast. Uh, they deteriorated and um, Camp Douglas again was fairly new in the fall of 61 
and it um, it was about 80 acres at that time, but then it was uh, adapted to serve as a prison camp for those Confederates captured at Fort Donaldson. Um, due to prisoner exchanges during the first two years of the Civil War, the numbers there of those held, it fluctuated. It was though considered one of the largest military prison camps in the North, holding up a total of 26,000 men by the war's end. It, sometimes it was described as the North's Andersonville. And from February through September in 1862, 518 prisoners died. And on April 10th, 1862, a petition was sent from Camp Douglas to Andrew Johnson, who was the military governor from men of the 42nd, the 48th, the 49th, and the 50th Tennessee Infantry Regiments, expressing a desire to take the oath of allegiance to the federal government, hoping that he would intercede on their behalf. So again, Private Weekly is part of this 42nd Tennessee Regiment. So they were pretty fortunate. Um, about three quarters of a way down, I wish I would have highlighted it. Uh, Rufus Weekly's name is on there and he was the lucky one and he um, actually got exchanged at that time. So the prison by population by the time of August 28th, 1862, it was close to 8,000 prisoners at that time. And so uh, they, the exchange went through um, as soon as practical, they were going to do that. And so they started that on September 8th, 1862. And Colonel Tucker, the camp's first commander, received word to transfer those prisoners. So they were to leave in groups of 1,000 by regiment via Cairo, Illinois, to Vicksburg, Mississippi. And again, Private Weekly was one of those Confederates exchanged on that day. So they were loaded onto freight cars on the Illinois Central Ro Railroad to Cairo, then transferred onto steamers down the Mississippi River. And the steamers would fly uh, white flags. They would only steam during the day um, stay in the river uh, in the evening time. Some people would take pot shots at them, of, of course, during the day. But they did end up at Vicksburg, and Vicksburg was not prepared to receive so many prisoners at that time. So Clinton, Mississippi became the rendezvous point for that exchange. And it's hard to believe that rations were actually worse than at Camp Douglas, and all the, and then plus all the men between the ages of 18 and 40 were conscripted for another two years of service. And they didn't even get furloughs um, after being those prisoners of war. And then once again, they started having to drill like they just joined the army once again. And just a side note on, on Camp Douglas, which I found uh, pretty interesting. It was actually torn down in December of 1865 and it wasn't until 2014 that a historical marker was erected on the site there. And there was a, approximately 4,200 Confederates prisoners who died at Camp Douglas, and they were reinterred from two of the small cemeteries at the camp in a mass grave um, to Oakwood Cemetery, where they also installed this 30-foot uh, granite monument there. So more Confederate soldiers are buried in Chicago than anywhere else in the Mason-Dixon line, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. So back to the 42nd, uh, they moved out uh, and engaged in, in different battles in 1864 and then joined the campaign through Georgia, fighting battles at New Hope Church, uh, Pine Mountain, Kennesaw, Smyrna Depot, uh, Peachtree Creek, Atlanta, Lick Skillet, and the weeks that followed saw the virtual destruction of Hood's Army of the Tennessee at that time. So again, I, I really like these maps that uh, um, the Civil War Trust does. So the Battle of Franklin, we're just gonna jump right ahead, um, occurred on November 30th, 
1864 in Franklin, Tennessee, that had a population of about 2,000 on that fateful day. It was more destructive uh, to the 42nd Regiment than any previous battle. So the Federal Armory, uh, I'm sorry, the Federal Army got to the small town of Franklin um, first at around dawn and soldiers wasted no time in building earthworks during that time, uh, forming like a defensive line that, that formed this semicircle around town just over a mile in length. And then on top of the breastworks, they stacked Osage orange shrubs that formed a impenetrable abatis on top of that. And again, it was a beautiful fall day the sky was clear, the temperature almost reached 60 degrees. And they say that if you lived in middle Tennessee, it's almost like New England with the, with the extreme temperature changes that occur at that time. And I'm always so fascinated with the, the Battle of Franklin for, for many reasons, um, but also how they portrayed the battle when they talk about it, they describe it, especially just before it begins. And Colonel Ellison Capers in the 24th South Carolina wrote, we beheld the magnificent spectacle the battlefield presented. Bands were playing, general and staff officers and gallant couriers were riding in front of and between the lines. 100 battle flags waving in the smoke of battle and bursting shells were wreathing the air with great circles of smoke while 20,000 brave men were marching in perfect order against the foe. So this is John Bell Hood's Army of Tennessee hoping to destroy their General Schoenfield and his Federal Army before they got to Nashville. So at 4 p.m., uh, you have roughly 20,000 Confederate soldiers stepping off line uh, some of them on Winston Hill and beginning advancing toward almost the same number of Union troops over two miles of open ground. We all hear so much about Pickett's Charge, but it's rare that you don't hear about this. And this was, there was more open ground here at the Battle of Franklin. I, I, I don't understand that, but to me, it's just fascinating. So you have artillery just fire ripping into the southern lines as they're, they're moving forward to the Union breastworks there. Um, the Confederate attack soon escalated into a headlong charge at that time. William Corliss Brigade, where the 42nd is a part of, was raked with artillery fire into their right flank during that time. So the officers and soldiers were just hacking at the branches of this orange Osage. That's what all those little circles are in front of the, um, the Union breastworks there, are, is the thorns, the brush, the vines. And they say it was almost eight feet high in some areas there. So they had a great defensive position. And then you have the, these, these Confederates like just in this open area, just going right for it. So they wanted these, these uh, soldiers were trying to break the snarl of branches and thorns all in there. Screams of terror were breaking out, mixed with cursing, yelling. I'm sure the confusion. Some of the men were even trying to crawl over the top of these thorny pieces only to get tangled up and shot to pieces. And Waltham's front line was just right in the middle of it. Um, Many men fell dead and wounded bodies fell onto that orange Osage there. There, the mangled and torn remains just created uh, like a haunting spectacle. I always think of World War I um, over the, the barbed wire in no man's land there when, when you think of that. Um, they were partially suspended in those thorny branches at that time. And some men were picked off with Henry rifles and Springfield rifle muskets, and the wounded were repeatedly shot until they also died. Uh, also, I, I'm sure you've read reports of where so many bodies were piled in front of the Union cannons that they actually had to kick the, the bodies over 
because they were blocking the cannons at that time. It was, it was thick there. Sadly, tragically, this is somewhere where Private Rufus Weekly and his brother James Polk Weekly were shot and killed at this area, somewhere in here. So I think the most fascinating thing to me about the Battle of Franklin was that it was approximately five hours in length, and they say per, perhaps the five bloodiest hours of the Civil War, and mostly fought at night. You know, the battle started at four o'clock, but then sunset was at 434. And, and when we think of true darkness, I don't think a lot of us truly understand that because of all, all the lights. We don't see that night sky. I know I do. I don't here. And so to think of that, just how dark it is. So the majority of the battle was, was done at night. So there was about 8,500 combined casualties, um, roughly 6,000 of those being Confederates. 14 con Confederate commanders became casualties. Six were killed, five were wounded, one captured. And 60 of Hood's 100 regimental commanders were killed or wounded. And that's, it's devastating. Private Albert McKinney said, I can never forget the blood red sun going down through smoke at our backs while we moved forward to the federal fire nor how later in the evening, the ground was so slippery with blood that men could scarcely retain their foot in, and the air was so heavy with the smell of blood and gunpowder that it was almost sickening to a soldier at that time. And I always can't imagine the sight of Franklin after the sounds of the battle died down and the sun rose over Franklin the following day on December 1st, 1864, just after 6 a.m. I mean, just death hanging in the air, devastation, destruction, evident everywhere. And if you survive the, the battle, I, I don't know, for some of these Confederates, it probably almost got worse when they were the ones who were on the burial detail at that time. So they had the grim task of burying the dead. And most of those dead, including Private Rufus Weekly and his brother James, were buried along the length of the federal breastworks, basically near where they were killed. And most of the dead were identified by name as well as by their unit. And they, the information was carved on these wooden markers. And this is where they remained for a good year. I think, though, too, that we forget is that a lot of these battles took, took place on, on private property, on, on farmland. And so this farmland needed to be plowed after a while. And uh, so Carnton Plantation here is owned by John and Carrie McGavick, and it was used as a field hospital the night of the battle and for days and months after the battle. And so they say that every bed, uh, the outbuildings, floor space was all taken up by injured and dying men, like patients were covering the porch, the yard, everywhere. And Carrie McGavick, um, the wife of John, she became known as the Angel of Carnton for just her tireless efforts caring for these wounded and dying that passed the doors of Carnton. They said she was making bandages uh, out of table linens, her, her dresses, uh, curtains, anything they could find, um, they were doing their part. So how can you plow a field where soldiers are buried? And that was the plan originally because these farmers needed to make some money, they needed to plant these crops. But then they saw these deteriorating graves and markers and that was probably the motivating factor in exhuming the dead. But then what do you do with the dead? Where do you put them? So John McGavick actually donated says a suitable plot of ground out of his landed possessions, embracing a portion of the battlefield. 
And this was about five acres at the time. And the board, there was a board that was soon established. And one week later, they made an official appeal for funds to help exhume the dead. So many former patients who actually convalesced at Cartman uh, contributed several hundred dollars toward the expense of, of um, conveying and removing these dead. And so uh, the bid-in process started because they had this board and the final price was $5 per body. This was about $88.19 in, in 1865 to exhume the dead, move them to Carton and bury them again. And if the team was unable to identify the bodies there by either name or state, it was moved to an exclusive um, unknown section, which eventually numbered 255. So this is the one of the original drawings of that plot that they planned at Carnton. And it's pretty neat to me how they did it by state. Um, so they wanted to group those men together. And then if you see on the bottom left-hand corner there, it's that is the unknown section at that time. So by uh, June of 1866, the work of gathering the Southern dead was complete at 1,481 burials at that time. So this is a modern day picture of uh, Carnton, um, the house, and also uh, a shot of the cemetery there. And not only did the McGavocks donate their land, but then also the maintenance fell to them as well. And it's very interesting how veterans and their families just started to visit the cemetery more and more over the years and Carrie McGavick she was always there. This is another um, great shot of the cemetery. She was always there to greet these visitors, to talk to them um, ab about their sons. And she kept a book and uh, either some people have called it the book of the dead or the cemetery book that they kept safe for so long with the names of the soldiers buried in that cemetery. And you can see it if you go and visit Carnton Plantation. And the book passed from Carrie to her son, and then her son didn't live very long, and it passed to her daughter, Hattie. And then Hattie's husband, George, though, made some very shocking changes to the book. And it's interesting because when there was unknowns in this book, he um, went in and changed them and put names of the soldiers down for some reason on that. So uh, they, there's a reason why he could have done that. He started receiving these letters from relatives asking if a particular soldier was buried in that cemetery. And he wanted to make others happy by telling them what they basically wanted to hear and continue to add names to unknown graves, including Rufus Weekly's and his brother, James. So originally, James and Rufus were unknowns. And then he scratched that name out. And then he put their names on there and then put a number on their block. So you can see on this picture, it says 197 JKPW James um, K Polk Weekly. So it's it, his body is not there. They are in the unknown section. Um, but again, he wanted to make these families feel good um, about that. So although listed in the weekly review, this was a, a newspaper, as unknown, again, the cemetery stone is engraved with Rufus and um, James Weekly Polk's um, name on those. And today, though, now the McGavick Cemetery, um, that is an official organization that maintains the, the cemetery. So there is a group. So the Civil War just 
devastated the weekly family. You have the older brother, George Washington weekly, you know, he did survive the war with these multiple wounds. Robert Lee weekly, he lost a leg at the Battle of New Hope Church. You have Thomas Weekly, who was killed at the Battle of New Hope Church. You have Rufus and James killed at the Battle of Franklin. And if you look on the top here, Thomas Jefferson Weekly, the father, he died on January 31st, 1865. And then his wife, Jerusha, died four days later. So I've, I've looked to see if there was like an influenza epidemic. I don't know, you, you know, you think it could have been, a, you know, you said, some people say you could die of a broken heart. Um, that was crushing what the Civil War did to these families. So I just wanna go over also some of the damage on this, this rifle close up. So you can see probably like a mini ball, you know, hit um, the firearm as well. That is the one that is really intriguing. It is a mini ball forward of the trigger. And uh, I think that is why, you know, you would have these um, ordinance officers walk in the battlefields after the battles, collecting firearms, you know, sending some back to the armory, using some, um, burning the ones or crushing the ones that they don't want anybody else to use. And so I think this is why they probably picked up this one here is because of that mini ball. We, we don't have anything in our collection like this one so battle damaged when it's uh, with that mini ball still in there as well. So let's see. So just because uh, I just wanna come back to the map because you wonder if he was at shoulder arms, like you think he had to have been at shoulder arms when that mini ball hit that firearm. And you see how battle damaged the, the rifle is. So I'm thinking Rufus probably got hit pretty well um, at that time. And this is another, another shot of it. So it was pretty uh, exciting to me um, in October um, 2019, I was able to connect with a weekly descendant. And this is Stephen Rufus Weekly, and he is the great nephew of Rufus Weekly. So his brother, George Washington Weekly, this is his um, great grandson here. And so he was able to see Alex, that's our curator, and learn more about the rifle musket that his great uncle carried into battle. And the cool part is to hold a piece of that family history there. And it was so sad because two weeks later, after his visit to the armory, Stephen Rufus Weekly passed away. But to me, it was not before um, we were able to connect the past to the present, which I think is just um, so important to history. So if you want to learn more about uh, the Battle of Franklin, um, here are some books that you can read. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I would love to answer them for you. Um, fantastic presentation, Susan. We actually do have a question that is in the chat here. Let me pull that up real quick see here. Uh, Ruth asks, one of the pictured weapons at the beginning of the presentation with the carving in the stock reflected the words, trust in God. Did a preponderance of these carvings feature sentiments with religious overtones? That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, I think there was only that one and one other, but then the other one was artwork because it had an angel on it and that one i did not post on there but those are the only two of about a dozen that we have with artwork that have any kind of religious overtones on them you know sometimes we get um i think god and country mm -hmm. um and those are the only ones 
do you tend to see the, the more patriotic designs or, or they tend to be more personal? Um, we get uh, the sweetheart names. Mm. We get um, their names. Um, one of them was the a character in a book, which I thought was fascinating. The book was a bestseller in 1864 and they put her name, her name was Electra, and they put that Electra Gray on her rifle, which I thought that was pretty interesting too, that one. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it really varies with battles too. That's that's probably the most popular, the battles. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, Carter, I hope Carter. to do like a presentation on just all the different uh, personalized firearms we have. That would be that would be pretty pretty fun. That would be know. great. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, put us down on the list for people to to listen to that. That sounds absolutely. fantastic. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I know the medical museum is working in the background for us this evening. Kyle, are there any uh, any additional questions on the live stream? Other than otherwise, I've got a couple myself. Let's see here. Doesn't look like he, nope, okay. Doesn't look like he's got anything chiming in. So I was curious about the reburial process. Uh, as you know, Susan, I've got a, a pretty extensive background with the Maryland campaign and the Battle of Antietam. There's a big reburial process that occurs at Antietam in 66 and 67. It sounds like the reburials at Franklin were pretty close to the same time. Yeah. I was curious though, you, did you say that they actually began in 65? No, in 66. Oh yeah, oh. In, um, no, it was a year after. So it was late 65, early 66 that they started. Um, because again, they waited a solid year, but then, you know, they talk about these, these wagons that would go back and forth. And then the farmer who was owning that property was saying, hey, I've got to start like plowing that. And uh, it seems like Carrie McGavick was the one who was the most concerned about that. So it was pretty nice that her or John donated five acres for that. And they said even when the federal troops went back through there um, a year later, they could still see some of those um, bodies coming up you know, which they mm. talk about like um, Antietam and Gettysburg was a problem with the animals rooting through there and such. Right. So I thought it was interesting how they got a board together so quickly to have this cemetery committee. And is that the same as Antietam too? They had a committee that, that started that? Um, more or less, it it it's spurred on by the fact that the state purchases the land and they need to they need to clear the fields as well. It's all about trying to clear the fields so that they can get back to utilizing the landscape right. in Maryland. Um, right. But the state buys the land of where the National Cemetery is eventually developed. And then in 66 and 67, those federal debt are disinterred and placed there. Yeah, it was um, it, it was pretty interesting that whole process there. Um, you know, of course, going out to bid, it's just like, wow, it just sounds like uh, the government there, you know, things going out to bid. And right. um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was quite the process. And I think such a huge undertaking during that time to actually find um, somebody who would do that. And I know um, a lot of times he didn't get paid for a lot of the work he did, too, for that. Mm. So, so, yeah. Now, we do have a question that just came in. How many of the dead in the cemetery are actually amongst the identified? You said there was about 250-ish that are on? Right, right. And then I think there was about 1,700 that they buried. Um, so that those aren't bad odds there when maybe it was about 1,500 that were identified, which to me is pretty impressive. That like, is impressive. Yeah, only 255. But it, you know, it breaks my heart thinking that, you know, the weeklies are part of those unknowns. Right. Of um, course. Yeah. 
And, and so I would like to get more into the weeds of it because, you know, if you talk about the percussion and the effective range of that rifle, you know, how close was Rufus to the breastworks when he was killed, you right. know, from, from that mini ball. That is fascinating to me. So going into the forensics and stuff, I'd still like to dig more. I, I continuously dig into this. Like it's, it's not over the research. Oh, the research is never over. <laughs> no, it's not right. You, you start going into the weeds more and more. And I just sometimes get frustrated because the armory kept horrible records when so many of these firearms were coming in and hmm. why, how did this firearm come to the armory? That's what I want to know. You know, um, we have no idea. They just, they just, uh, at least they, they knew it was from the battle of Franklin. So that was very helpful, but I, I there are so many questions unanswered. And like I said, so many of these firearms are anonymous. So I'm so glad Rufus weekly basically left his calling card on this rifle. Otherwise, I wouldn't know this tragic story and what this war did to the Weekly family. So there were four Weekly brothers that went in? There was, yeah, yes. And then there was two older ones that were, you know, that they didn't join. But okay. um, yeah, actually five, five went, Rufus and his, his brother and his three older brothers too. And, and even the, the sisters, uh, one of their husbands was killed too. So- and they, they couldn't bring the bodies back because there was basically nobody left to do it. So, so but, which of the, we have what, two of the, two of them are killed at the Battle of Franklin. One of them's killed at the Battle of Peach Creek, Peach Tree no, Creek. New Hope Church. Oh, excuse me. New Hope Church. Right. Uh, One has his leg amputated from New Hope Church. Okay. And then George Washington Weekly, the oldest one, he is wounded, um, but he survives the war too. So, and, and then both the parents uh, die within four days of each other. And then uh, the sister, I think it's uh, Paulina's husband, he dies um, at uh, uh, Corinth, Corinth. Corinth, yeah. Yes. Truly yeah. devastated family. Yeah. Uh, is it George Washington Weekly that goes back to Tennessee? And, and is that who the descendant was uh, related to? Yes, yes. And then I'm also speaking to um, his, um, Stephen Rufus Weekly passed away. So now I talk to David Weekly, who's his brother. So I get a lot of information and uh, it's great. He's so uh, helpful with all my questions and, and such. And um, I want to know where, um, Thomas Jefferson and Jerusha were buried. And then he sent me that, that plot map. And then I saw wow. that they're buried on the property. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. But it's, it's sad because also um, the brother who, who passed away at New Hope Church, he's buried there. And so these brothers are like kind of all over the place um, buried. And, and that is so sad. But that if you've ever been to Franklin, that McGavick Cemetery is so beautiful and so peaceful and it could be a lot worse. There is that. Yeah. Was it just George Washington Weekly that uh, kept the family going then after that and, and uh, actually had offspring or was the other brother who had his leg amputated, did he also build a family? I don't think he married. I, oh. I don't think he did. It was the sisters um, and George Washington. And uh, but I tell you, there's weeklies all over Cheatham County, all over. <laughs> so it's uh, what do they say about swinging a dead cat or something? You, you right. know, it's uh, they're everywhere. So um, that's it gets very confusing. But thank goodness for Ancestry um, mm -hmm. and Fold Three. That's where I get like a lot of this um, information that the National Archives um, it, that that's been so helpful. Excellent. Let me pull up one more question that's come in here. It's a little bit more involved. Did they consider Franklin, Tennessee, their own state at one point, or am I way off base there? Was it named after Ben Franklin? Well, these are Tennessee troops after all, so that would have been 
considered their state, but I don't know. Do you know, Susan, uh, what Frank, uh, what Franklin, Tennessee is named after? I do not. That's a great question. I'm, I'm, I know we'll, uh, I know we'll all look it up afterwards. I certainly will. <laughs> and, another and line of research. I, that's how I learn more about it. It's also interesting to me how um, there was only like 2000, 2000 was the population at that, that time of the battle. And then afterwards when the Confederate and Union troops are coming in, how much that, you know, exploded um, that population and how almost every building was used as hospitals um, during and after the, the battle. But usually you uh, hear about the Carter farm and sure. also Carnton Plantation were, were the two that you you hear the most out of. So if anybody has a chance, oh my gosh, go go to the Battle of Franklin. Uh, it's through the Battle of Franklin Trust runs it. They're a great organization. They've been so helpful with my research. And you can go on so many different tours there at the time. And you can visit uh, the weeklies, but don't go in the Tennessee section of the cemetery. Uh, go over to the unknowns and you can pay your respects there. So to me, this is why I love history. It's connecting the past to the present or the present to the past. And that is so important. Absolutely, it is. And we really appreciate you being with us tonight, Susan, and, and doing this presentation. Thank Great you research. so much uh, for oh, having very me. Welcome. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who took time out of their evening to uh, join me this evening. And I always hope uh, you learn something and maybe you could do some, uh, some more reading about Franklin. Absolutely. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders before we leave you all for this evening. Uh, this is the last of our season regular meetings for the, uh, the, Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. We're going to be restarting our season in this coming September, but we are gonna be trying to get back to doing some of our summer programming. And I'm very pleased to announce that our first field trip after a couple of years off will be this June 23rd at 7 p.m at the Mount Olivet Cemetery here in Frederick. Our vice president, our very own Gary Dyson is gonna be leading this cemetery tour looking specifically at confederate row and the research he's done on those troops that are buried there so i invite everybody to come out and join us for that again this is kind of our special summer programming and we'll be getting back to our regularly scheduled programs come september and keep an eye on your email folks because we're going to be having our summer newsletter and we're going to have some announcements about our september meeting because it's we're doing something a little special for the beginning of next season but again, Susan, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you again to our partners, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Definitely check them out over the summer months. They're going to have some great exhibits, as they always do. And of course, it's a way to uh, get out of the heat, because that's going to start crushing us real soon. But again, have a great uh, rest of your evening and a great summer. And we look forward to seeing you all this coming June 23rd, 7 p.m. at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Have a great night. Thank you.